take us on to the next agenda item, which is analysis of the financial viability of public educational and government access television, known as the PEG study. And if you remember, we all agreed that something needed to be done, but we didn't know what it was. Um, we sent it over to appropriations. They found some money <laughs> and we're back. And I've got Ken on, on the agenda first. Is that, is the, is the way I've got Ken Jones, Peter Blum, Dr. Robert Lube, and Lauren Glendavidian in that order. Is that the order that works best for the presenters or do you have an order? All right, Lauren says that works. Okay. So I guess, and I think I saw Peter with a thumbs up. So Ken, I guess the floor is yours. And, I, and thank you, Madam Chair. I won't need the floor for long, but it is just to kind of recount the history that last year uh, we were asked the agency, of, oh yeah, Ken Jones, Economic Research, Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And uh, the legislature asked us last year to carry out a study on the future financial viability uh, for PEG, for the public educational and government television services. And uh, we did, we put out an RFP in the late fall and had two respondents. And one of them was Berkshire Telecommunications, which is represented today by um, both Peter Bloom and Dr. Luby. Um, and they, we gave them the assignment largely taken from the text of the legislation to explore the options. And that's the report that you have in front of you. And uh, with that, I would like Peter, Peter's prepared to go through that report. And so that's what I'd like to do at this point. Okay, Peter, welcome back. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I know many members of the committee, but not all. And uh, I just want to take a moment to introduce myself to those whom I haven't met before. Um, I am a, a retiree of the state of Vermont. I work for some years for the Legislative Council and some years for the governor and quite a number of years for the Public Service Board, which has since been renamed. And I now live in Massachusetts, which is almost like Vermont. And uh, today with me is uh, Bob Loeb, um, who is uh, actually Dr. Bob Loeb, who is uh, a PhD economist. Um, he is a partner in an uh, organization called Volca Loeb, um, which is, as a business, uh, operates the Federal Communication Commission's TRS programs, Telecommunications Relay Service. They're the financial advisor for, or the financial manager for the TRS programs under contract with the FCC. And Bob uh, formerly worked for a variety of state utility commissions. And where I first met him a number of years ago was he was a staff economist at the FCC. So I've asked Bob as my co-author to come in today in case you have any questions about his part of the report, which is the financial forecast for the PEG organizations. So now if I'm allowed, and I think I am, okay, well, I'm gonna bring up like my the screen. committee to introduce themselves to you. Uh, Hello again, Peter Blum, Mark McDonald. Hi, Mark. Okay, he Senator. started it, so we'll go around. I'm I'm not sure how to go. If no one says anything. Hi, Peter. Chris Pearson from Jimmy Center. Randy Brock from Franklin County. Okay. Hey, Peter. Ruth Hardy from Addison County. Nice Senator. to meet you. Hi, Peter. Michael Sorokin. Nice to see you again. Hi, Senator Sorokin. And uh, Chris Bray, also from Addison County. I heard you on VPR the other night. So that was like the teaser. I'm ready now. <laughs> Your cross-examination is probably all set. <laughs> um, okay. All right, so here Where we go. I'm going to put my screen up if I can do it. And you should see that in a moment. And I have about 20, 25 slides to show you. Um, let's see, if it, has it appeared yet? It yeah. is there. Okay. So um, this is just the title slide. And um, I'll go back to that. So the, you, a lot of the, these preliminary slides, you'll already know a lot of this stuff. 
PEG means public educational and governmental programming. And the goal of this study, as you stated it in the legislation you passed last summer, was to look at options to quote, ensure the financial stability and viability of PEG channels. We looked at the likely financial future. We looked at possible efficiencies and forms of organization. And we looked at possible new financing mechanisms. So an overview of the slides that I'm gonna to do today, just quickly, um, we've talked about the background sum. There'll be a little more of that. There'll be the revenue forecast, which uh, Dr. Loeb uh, did and is available here for questions. And then we'll talk about efficiency options, business model options, the many constraints that are in federal law, five suggested revenue enhancement options, and finally a, a recommendation. So I'll begin with some history. Um, some of you may know this already. Cable companies started as what were called community antenna services, serving small areas. And over the 80s and thereafter, many of them were acquired by larger companies and merged. It began, PEG, PEG began as a mandated FCC service. It was an initial, initially an analogy to the quote, public interest obligations of commercial broadcasters. You may remember public service messages appearing on television at nine o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. Well, PEG was the cable analogy to that originally. And the PEGs, PEG organizations are called all sorts of different things. One common term is AMO, which if you read in the, law, in the Vermont law, it means administrative management organization. I think probably nobody knows that but me, uh, but I, I think it's often called access media organizations also. And we're gonna go forward here, I hope. Today, Vermont has 11 cable companies. Comcast has the great majority of the customers and there are 25 AMOs um, serving a good portion of the state, but not all of the state. Uh, all are non, well, let me correct that, not officially serving all of the state. They do serve really the whole world through the internet, but their footprint uh, service areas does not cover the, the full map of the state. And um, their, their formal coverage area is limited to the areas served by cable. Um, but as I said, the actual service area can be larger depending on the community of interest. So a rural uh, PEG organization might broadcast a graduation for a regional high school that could be of interest to many people, some of whom are cable customers and in the PEG service area and some of whom live outside that service area but are just as interested in watching their children march across the stage. PEG financing is controlled by Vermont statute and specifically by PUC rule 8,000, which was enacted pursuant to Vermont statute in the 1990s. And to my surprise, I learned that um, the AMOs are certified by the cable company, not by the state. So the process is that when they first were setting up, uh, individuals in the communities formed groups, formed a corporation, and they went to the cable companies. The cable companies determined whether the, the, the proposal met the qualifications. And then at that point, the cable companies certified the AMO and the AMO became eligible for funding. Once that's happened, the cable companies must provide channels for the AMO programs. They must pay for AMO operating expenses with a limit of 5% of the cable companies operating cable revenues, that's an important word, cable. And they must pay capital expenses uh, enough for the AMO to operate. And in actuality in Vermont right now, the capital payments to AMOs vary from zero to 1.25%, but most receive 0.5% of cable revenues as capital payments. And these, the amount of these payments are negotiated periodically between the AMOs and the cable companies. The AMOs also are required and do file detailed annual, annual reports 
with information about their finances and operations. And uh, that, sim- the, that fact simplified my study quite a bit. I, I learned a great deal from these reports. They are available, uh, I think on request, I'm not sure if they're available um, online, but they're available on request from the Department of Public Service. And um, the uh, Lauren Glenn Davidian's organization, VAN, and the AMOs made a set of them, a multi-year set of them available to Bob Loeb and myself, which greatly helped us out in doing the study. So the AMOs perform multiple roles. They record government activity and events of public interest like graduations and sport events. They also, in many cases, will routinely record school board meetings and um, selectmen's meetings and that sort of thing, public hearings, They train video volunteers and they do this in a lot of ways. They take interns. They, some some of them have joint programs with high schools. Some of them just have people who walk in and want to learn how to do this. And the AMO generally accommodate those people, train them on how to be video producers and then give them a forum to produce shows of their own. I, in my report, I uh, concluded that the role that they perform is something like a combination of town hall, (coughs) town library, public school, and the speaker's corner, which is famous in England in Hyde Park. Um, The speaker's corner, maybe I should have been a little bit, explained that a little better. Some of the uh, AMO directors, and I guess I talked to about 18 or 20 of them, uh, some of them are quite passionate about their role in promoting free speech. Um, They feel a a real sense of of obligation to make sure that uh, people in their communities have a way to get their thoughts and opinions out uh, broadly to the community. The funding sources for the AMOs is 92% from the cable companies. The remaining 8% comes from their own activities, fees, memberships, what they call underwriting or donations and other sources. The expenditure of, uh, of the AMOs for all statewide is about $8 million. Uh, the size of the budgets vary quite a bit from one place to another. The largest budget is about 800000 The smallest budget is 75000 The PEG uh, organizations are rapidly shifting, and in many cases really already have shifted, to digital technology and internet streaming. Now, in originally what they had was a wire from the cable company that if they put signals into it would appear on people's televisions. That was an analog signal, meaning it was a voltage that went up and down over time. But with the advent of digitization and the internet, they have been able to produce higher quality video, uh, store it and transmit it in lots of new ways. So this increases customer convenience, and it also allows them to extend the benefit of their service outside the cable footprint to the larger region. The federal regulation of cable has a lot of detail in it. Um, The original law that was passed, actually the FCC regulated cable sort of on its own motion originally, but in 1984, Congress weighed in with a major piece of legislation. And it's today called Title VI of the Communications Act. And it allocates responsibility between the federal government and so-called franchising authorities. In most of the country, the franchising authorities are cities, counties, and towns. In New England, it's towns. In the Midwest and West, it's counties and cities. Um, But they also, um, the act, the 1984 act also greatly limited the authority of the states over rates and subsequent amendments in 94 and other times, 90 something and other times uh, further limited the ability of the state utility commission to regulate rates. Title VI sets a limit on franchise fees. The limit is 5% of cable operating revenues is the maximum that can be required to be paid as a franchise fee for the use of the public rights of way. And in Vermont, all of that money is sent to the AMOs directly without passing through the state treasury. Uh, No added contribution, says the FCC, can be required 
from internet or from telephone service revenues. Now, when the 1984 Act passed, of course, cable, telephone, and digital communications were all separate industries, but that's no longer true. Capital expenses, so-called, are excluded from the 5% maximum. In many states, or at least a few, uh, there's an additional 1% contribution that's routinely required for capital expenses. So in California, for example, in many places, 5% is required uh, of the operating revenues to be paid to, in, in California's case, municipalities, plus an additional uniform 1% is charged that's paid to the cable companies, which are obligated to certify or to show somehow that it's used only for capital and not for operating. General taxes, such as the sales tax, are not counted as franchise fees. There's uh, some information in my report about viewership. Um, I found uh, information, uh, very useful information in the Department of Public Services uh, telecommunications plan and even more useful information and detailed in the recent COVID response plan that was done quickly over the fall. Um, and there was quite a bit of detail in there about PEG viewership overall. Some of it a little surprising to me. I'll read to you the quote here. Overall PEG viewership has been steady or increasing. And in many cases, the Vermont community's engagement with PEG resources has increased significantly with many stations reporting spikes in Facebook views, YouTube views, and Google website traffic during the pandemic months. And that of course reflects the fact that the PEG uh, programming is not just appearing on cable television, but is appearing on social media and on websites. This is the surprising one to me, how far along this has gotten. The, um, the consultant who did that COVID response report said that far more respondents in their survey said that they had accessed PEG content using their broadband connection than using the local cable channels. So the, the tail is uh, now wagging the dog in terms of which is the larger market, it seems. The AMO role in disseminating information was particularly useful, thought this other consultant, because many municipalities have struggled to engage citizens and elected officials via online tools and have made plans for larger engagement challenges like town meeting day. So I did run across studies, uh, uh, incidental uh, reports where people have said, gee, you know, we, we, uh, we had trouble during the COVID experience figuring out how to do town meeting, but we used the, uh, the PEG facilities and people were very, very appreciative of, of the filming of it. Um, now I'm gonna move into the revenue history and the forecast. Um, the recent revenue uh, of the AMOs has generally been stable over the last five years. There was one exception in 2018-19 because there was a national change in accounting rules for how companies like Comcast are supposed to account for their cable revenues. And I can answer in more detail and Bob Loeb can answer in more detail if you wish, but just um, in summary, the, the accounting change reduced the proportion of total cable company revenue that was allocated as cable revenue. And then therefore, since PEG revenue is proportional to cable revenue, it reduced PEG revenue. And here's a chart that shows what the last five years look like. Um, you can see the top blue line is a total revenue, which has bounced around a little bit, dipped into 2016 and 2018, but it's been fairly consistent. The amount of cable fees, again, as I said earlier, is 92% of that, and that's the dashed line below that. The amount paid by Comcast is a high percentage of that, which is the dotted line below that. And the other revenue generated by the AMOs is at the bottom in the long purple dashes. So for the revenue forecast, um, what we used was uh, two primary variables. Um, we looked at the average revenue per unit that 
the cable companies earn and the number of cable subscribers that they have. Um, Bob Loeb produced a high normal estimate for 2026, showing total peg payments declining from 7.82 million to 7.46, a loss of about 0.4 million. That was with an optimistic picture from the cable company's point of view about the loss of subscribers. With a more pessimistic view of loss of subscribers, we estimated a loss of 0.8 million. When you combine that with inflation, which we estimated at 1%, uh, we saw that the, by the 2026, the AMOs could be facing a 1.4 million deficit or 17% of the current spending level. And I want to make, uh, this looks like a um, fairly stable you know, environment compared to a lot of things that are going on in Vermont's budget, I'm sure. Um, but there are a lot of risks that were not quantified here that we really couldn't get our arms around mathematically. One is the changing FCC rules on in-kind cable contributions counting against the 5% cap. The FCC under the prior administration issued an order saying that a lot of the things that cable companies have to do as quote, in-kind end quote services would be valued and they would be subtracted from the 5% franchise fee limit, thereby reducing peg payments or AMO payments. That order has not yet gone into effect and it was appealed to the Federal Court of Appeals in um, Sixth Circuit. And as of this morning, I checked again and that case has not yet been decided. Um, there was a very broad challenge issued to the FCC's order. Um, and it, you know, nobody really knows what the court will do. If the court uh, rules for the appellants, then um, a lot of this will just probably disappear. If the court rules for the FCC, there could be substantial effects on future AMO payments, um, depending on what the new administration wants to do uh, at the FCC. Right now, I believe the FCC is down one seat and it's two Democrats and two Republicans and President Biden, no doubt, will soon name somebody. Um, the two areas where uh, I'm most worried about the future are um, the, um, the possibility that the FCC might start counting um, mandated free internet service and mandated free cable service, uh, both of which are requirements in most or all of the cable company CPGs, the, the Public Service Commission. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission has issued to cable companies. A second risk that's not been quantified is uh, increasing cable company losses of video subscribers. Um, we, our low normal um, prediction may actually not be so low. There are, we've encountered some other sources since the report was written suggesting that um, cable subscribership is dropping rapidly as people switch from cable service to online streaming. And the third uh, risk is that um, the cable companies at some point might simply decide to let their cable service drift and, uh, and not really promote it. And if, in that case, that would only accelerate the loss of, of cable subscribers and revenues. Now, this is the end of the part of my report dealing with revenue forecasts. And so, Maybe I should pause, Madam Chair, and see if there are any questions about the revenue forecast or anything else that I've covered up to now. Is there any questions? Senator Bray. Yeah, um, can you say a little more, even though you didn't quantify it, about the cable cutting risk for cable companies? You know, I've heard about people going to other, their ISP, replacing their programming that way. And, um, it's right. hard, hard to know what their revenues will be. And then if the AMOs are downstream of them, what it will mean for them over time. We, uh, we tried to get the customer counts for the Vermont cable companies, but they consider that confidential. And I declined to accept any confidential information in the process of preparing this report. So instead we use national figures um, and extrapolated from some um, SEC filings um, 
but I think the, the fear that we have is that the tendency of customers to cut the cable cord um, and, it's, and replace it with streaming video may follow a similar pattern to what happened 10 or 15 years ago with people cutting the, the telephone landline cord, which is that in the beginning, a few people cut, and then the next year, a few more people cut. And then at some point you get into a kind of an S curve and everything, you know, everything takes a nosedive. But I'm gonna ask Bob Lowe to address this in more detail. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Peter. Uh, always giving me the one that cannot be answered. Um, that is the problem. I think Peter outlined it right in that, you know, if you think back to your usage of your wireline phone and your wireless phone, at one time in the past, you know, you used your wireline phone when you were in the house and then you used your wireless phone when you were out doing shopping or do, running errands or doing something like that. But at some point in time, uh, you know, for each one of us, the wireline phone became obsolete. And so now, you know, we use our wireless phone for 90 to 95% or even 100% of our communications. And every once in a while we hear that phone ring in our house and we don't know what we did with it. And it's probably somebody who we don't wanna to talk to anyhow. So we don't, you know, we don't use it and we're steadily trying to get rid of the bill. If that happens in this industry, what that would mean would be that the, we would all, you know, all consumers would start moving away from cable channels for their video services and into video streaming. Right now, it appears something like where we were in telephone back in the, you know, 2000, where we, everybody used both. Everybody used the wireline and their wireless. And a lot of people didn't even have wireless, okay? That's where we are now, you know, and it's very hard to predict when it'll flip, when that tipping point will occur, when many people say, I don't wanna pay that $50 cable bill or 70 or $80 cable bill, and I'm already paying, um, you know, Amazon Prime and streaming is included in that and get rid of the cable. Now, you're asking me to look at my crystal ball and say when that would occur, I can't give you a, a, a good date for that. What I can do is say, you know, Peter and I took this seriously and we believe it's going to occur. And we think that the um, financial support of the AMOs and the PEG channels should recognize that that's what the future is going to be. And let's try to come up with a plan that will make the future revenue more secure and independent of that technological and consumer um, change that we know is coming. Madam Chair, can I follow up on that briefly? Yes. Um, yeah. So the, the cable could be supplying, you know, whatever uh, proprietary Comcast programming, or it could be just acting as your ISP, or it could be delivering voice over internet protocol. So uh, it's making me wonder, to what degree, if someone is, when we say cut the cord in this case, it's like, well, what part of, the, we're not really cutting the whole cord anymore. We're cutting like a piece, some functionality. It's just, unsu we, it's, right. it's just unsubscribing to the cable portion of your bill. That's all it is. Right. Right. You would right. probably uh, be purchasing your um, uh, internet through the cable company, or, you know, if the telephone company gets its act together, then you could purchase it from the internet, your internet from your, your telephone company. Um, where cable companies don't exist, um, mostly people buy their internet through the telephone company. And as I heard you discussing before, uh, that there's a lot of interest in the rural broadband. Um, but the cutting of the cord is essentially the cable video portion. The other thing that could occur is that um, given that the cable company knows people are less interested in their um, video service package, they could reduce the price of that and increase the price of their internet service, which in places where they serve, where Comcast serves, that's a pretty secure revenue stream. And if they did that, right without anybody dropping their cable service, 
that would decrease the revenues to the peg companies also. Because remember, what the peg companies get is the video portion of the bill, okay? Which is what you pay for your cable channels, uh, the rental of the equipment, and some portion of the video advertising. The, the PEG revenue is not associated with the part of your bill that covers your internet service or your voice service. Right, and is it, are we precluded from extending the funding scheme to include those two other services by law currently? Yes. Yes, we, Bob, do you wanna answer? Well, yes, I mean, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You can't do it. The, yep. the FCC has said that the 5% applies only to cable revenues and cannot be construed to apply to other kinds of revenues that the cable companies get from those same customers. Okay, thanks so much. So I'll pick up Madam Chair again. Yes, I uh, okay. am I seeing, I lost Senator Hardy. Senator, did you have a um, question? I did, but it was just answered um, and Senator Bray had the same question, so thank you. I'm sad. Okay, good. Then we can go back committee. I won't be able to see you because I have to shut you out so I can see the presentation. So holler if you have a question. Okay, here we go again. So uh, we asked, we were asked to look at efficiency options. One option would be horizontal mergers among the 25 PEG organizations. Um, we, we didn't think that, or I didn't think, uh, and I think Bob agreed that there was much to be gained here unless you're willing to accept service cuts. Um, the PEG organizations, in my opinion, are very well connected with their local communities. Some of them are operating on a shoestring. Some of them have a little bit more generous budgets, but they generally uh, have close relationships with their select men, with their school committees. And, um, and I think that if you force the merger um, some of that might be lost. I, having said that, that I don't think forced mergers are a good idea. I think voluntary mergers might be a good idea. Um, there are two organizations in Chittenden County that are now functionally merged and they're looking at a legal merger. Uh, Lauren Glenn Davidian can probably tell you more about that when it's her turn. Um, also, I know that some of the rural AMOs have been talking informally with others about whether they could manage a, a merger. Uh, but I think that, in my opinion, this is a question best left to the local boards to decide. Um, so I, I just didn't think that you could get anything out of this by, you know, if you, if you forced a merger, you would, there'd be two directors in the beginning, there'd be one director and a local site coordinator at the other afterwards. And I don't think you'd save much uh, unless you were willing to cut services. Any questions? Nope. Okay, should I go on? Yeah. Share, sharing resources is something that I think they could improve slightly. Um, they are doing through the VAN, Lauren Glenn's organization, they're doing some sharing of costs, their lobbying costs, some of their negotiating costs. They have a common database for storing programs called VMX. The statewide channel is being shared the cost of the statewide channel is being shared somewhat. Um, there are some other possibilities that might include accounting, payroll services. Um, one of the AMO directors suggested that they might be able to share some electronics. There's something called a video server that is very expensive and costly to maintain that maybe two of them could share. I don't have an opinion on it, but I, uh, I think it would be good to encourage them to keep talking that way and keep looking for those kinds of efficiencies. Um, the legislature abandoned the funding for Vermont Interactive Television some years ago. I looked at and I asked several times whether they saw any role for themselves in replacing that function. And I would say there was a mild level of enthusiasm for that. One of the things that's changed, of course, since VIT went away is that now there's Zoom and YouTube and all sorts of ways for people to get together electronically, which didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago when VIT was operating. Still, there might be some um, room for these uh, AMOs to maybe enlarge their meeting spaces so that on occasion, 
a group of 10 or 15 people could come in and meet with another group of 10 or 15 people somewhere else. An event that once the pandemic is over, you know, might not be possible uh, in quite the same way using Zoom. And, uh, and finally, they could work to expand their miscellaneous revenues. Um, as with any group of, you know, 25 separate organizations, some of them are better at this than others, have, got, have taken it farther. Some of them have made contracts with municipalities for recording and broadcasting selectmen's meetings. Others of them just look for a donation to be voted on at town meeting. So I think that they could get together and try to determine a set of best practices. But again, I don't think it's a topic for legislation. We looked also at business model options, um, but there, I didn't really find much. Um, everywhere the AMO equivalent organizations appear to be nonprofit, which is what is true in Vermont. Um, in some states, the negotiation for the payment from the cable company goes through the municipality. I live now in Massachusetts and that's the way it's done here. I really can't see an advantage to that. I think it works better and more directly for the AMOs to talk to the cable companies using their own representatives rather than trying to put words in the mouth of a committee of townspeople. Um, I also asked them about joint operations with educational institutions. It seemed like this ought to be an area of, of possibility um, both secondary and, and higher education. Um, but I, uh, I got a very mixed reaction to that. In some places, the AMOs are treated very well by the local uh, school boards and the school districts. One of them is actually located in a, in a, a regional high school. Um, but others, uh, in several cases, the, the directors told me stories about how they had taken in interns, but they couldn't quite get the, uh, the local high school, even if it was nearby, to consider them a full partner in an educational program. That, so joint enterprise seemed to be sort of beyond their reach. And I don't know if there's anything possible there or not. Um, it seemed like the educational community was less interested than the AMO community is. And uh, I didn't specifically look at the Vermont State Colleges, although that could be a potential in some cases, because I know that Vermont State Colleges are not looking for any place to expand their uh, expense obligations at the moment. Uh, we also looked at the possibility of imposing a more hierarchical structure like a state agency. Um, but while there's some minor things that could be gained from that in terms of uniformity, again, I think there's a risk to the local uh, accountability and, and communications. So I just want to, in this slide, I just want to stop and, and uh, explain about how different the world looks of telecommunications from the days when I was working at the Public Service Board trying to get the Vermont Universal Service Fund passed through the legislature. Um, there are two major developments that are really important and that are well along now. One is digital media and the internet. And as we talked about video streaming, with fewer cable subscribers, less peg revenue. We've talked about that in detail. Um, the other one is telecommunications competition. And in 1996, Congress passed a major telecommunications act. It passed uh, the Senate with only one Senator voting no, and that was Senator Leahy, I think to his eternal credit personally. Uh, and, uh, but it, what it did is it, it ended the rights of states to control the entry into telecommunications markets. And since then, everybody is in everybody else's market. Um, the digitization process has made it possible for almost every platform to carry almost every kind of service. Satellite has some problems because the geostationary satellites have a lag time that, that they work hard to overcome, but all the terrestrial services basically are pushing bits down fiber as far out as they can get them and then using some sort of last mile technology. Even the, even the wireless companies, if you looked at how many, if you looked at the bit miles of travel of their, of their communications, almost all of it is through fiber and only the last little bit is between the antenna and your handset. So every platform can provide every service and that makes the legal structure which began 
you know, in 1934 at the federal level and in 1980s and 90s in Vermont and, the, and at the federal level for cable and in 90s for the Vermont Universal Service Fund for telephone, all of that now looks excessive to me, excessively siloed and dated. Um, the, it's now a communications network. And at the time that we passed these old laws, there was a telephone network, there was a cable network, but they were separate. Now it's just all communications. So that colors the rest of my, my presentation. So I'm looking for goals for this new revenue options that I've been asked to, to examine. And I found in various places, a set of goals for tax systems. I'm sure your committee is more expert at this than I am. Here's one that I found from an Oklahoma tax study a few years ago. They said, the tax system should be reliable, simple, neutral, transparent, fair, and modern. But I wanna suggest that in this project, there's another important one, and that is competitive neutrality. And that means that you would treat competitors who are working uh, for the same customer against another company uh, should be treated alike for tax purposes to the extent you can. And that creates a bias against silo taxes on particularly indus particular industries. So now I'm gonna shift into a review, a quick review. I know we're running over time, Madam Chair. I'll try to move along. That's fine. We've got okay. some flexibility at the end, so. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna run through four or five limitations of federal law that are important. It's a little bit like a slalom uh, race when you're, as you legislators try to navigate, you know, your way down this mountain. Um, there are a lot of gates that you have to pass through. Uh, I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> there's a franchise fee limitation of 5% of cable revenues. I mentioned that it excludes peg capital costs, that excludes general taxes like the sales and use tax. I mentioned also that the third order expands the kinds of in-kind service. This is, third order was the FCC's name for its order that's on appeal in the Sixth Circuit. Um, expands the kind of in-services that are value, uh, which are to be considered franchise fees. And I mentioned that mandated cable service and mandated internet service appears to be widespread and a potential candidate for treatment as in kind. I also mentioned the third order is still on appeal. Another constraint is Universal Service Act, uh, the Federal Universal Service Act, which was a section of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. In um, Vermont, Vermont's Universal Service Fund predated 1996 by a year or two. And when you passed that, um, there were no federal restrictions other than what was in the, in the Constitution, the so-called Dormant Commerce Clause. And at the time that you passed this, you reviewed a recent then um, US Supreme Court decision called Goldberg versus Sweet, which had upheld the uh, Illinois sales tax on intrastate and interstate retail telecommunications revenues. People who are from the, the regulation community, the telecom regulation community, can't understand this still, uh, the, how this could be possible. They, they have this idea that there's a fundamental division between intrastate calls and interstate calls. And for a long time, that was true in the regulation of telephone. Uh, even even though at the time it was there was a lot of kludges that were necessary to make it even possible, but Vermont concluded that that was irrelevant to tax purposes. And uh, Vermont is was never challenged. The Vermont Universal Service Statute was never challenged in court, although some uh, statutes of similar nature in other states were and were overturned. So Vermont has had uh, this for 26 years without challenge. Um, <clears throat> but along came 96, the 96 Act, which included an apparent authorization for the states to have what we already had, uh, a universe, state universal service fund, and they had put a whole bunch of strings on it. Um, the, the state rule, if any, cannot be inconsistent with the commission's rules. Contributions must be equitable and non-discriminatory. The support mechanisms must be specific, predictable, and sufficient, and the support mechanisms cannot rely on or burden federal universal service support mechanisms. These um, vague requirements have been a terror 
over the in litigation. Um, and it's very hard to predict how any given court is going to rule. Sometimes the courts reach the same conclusion as another court, but they rely on a different paragraph or a different sentence. Um, the, the bottom line for me is that the 96 Act basically ruined the possibility of using universal service in any sort of creative way. Unless the FCC is on your side, you probably have a very low chance of success at innovating anything and calling it universal service. And I would say at the end, I'm saying that the post 1996 litigation did not clarify these concepts. And notably the FCC currently and recently is, appears strongly opposed in particular to letting states fund universal service by a surcharge on internet access. The third constraint is barriers to entry. This was the, the heart really of the 96 Act. It said that states can't do anything that prevents new entrants from coming into the local exchange market. And um, so it could potentially include a confiscatory charge or tax. Um, there's, the statute also includes a safe harbor exemption for management of rights of way. Um, but there's some uh, again, some lack of clarity as to how this would be interpreted by the courts. There was a round of lit litigation about 20 years ago on this, and the courts went sort of all different directions. Um, they, um, some of the language suggests that if the ch state charges something more than their cost of maintaining the right of way, that would violate 253. I don't think that's the law but I think a lot of people would say it is. Um, I reviewed several case decisions under this section and um, there were some cases where the courts invalidated local, now again, it's you know local franchising authorities are the ones in most of the country, invalidated some local franchising authorities that had reserved to themselves the unlimited discretion to deny a franchise if they so wished and that was clearly held to violate 253. Short of that kind of provision, um, it seems that the states have quite a bit of latitude. There was one case where a court upheld a 4% gross revenue charge on a cable company or on a telecommunications company that was seeking to install a couple of dozen miles of underground conduit. So again, this is not a clear area of law, but I think um, you have some room to maneuver here without fearing that you're creating a barrier to entry. The Internet Tax Freedom Act is the fourth area of, uh, of, on this slalom course you're trying to get down. Uh, states cannot tax Internet access. And it's now, after many times being reenacted with the sunset, it's now been permanently enacted and is a permanent part of federal law. There are some notable exceptions. One is for universal service. But again, as I said earlier, the FCC has great discretion over what we can call universal service. And right now they are not very favorable or have not recently been very favorable to any sort of innovation that involves using the internet. Um, a second exception is for 911 and E911 and if time permits, I'll get into that again in a few slides from now. The final, uh, fifth and final, is federal broadband policy. And uh, under Chairman Pai, who recently left the FCC, um, they issued something called the Restoring Internet Freedom Order in 2017. And that this reversed an FCC position. I think this was the third reversal on this binary question uh, in, over the course of the last 25 years. And now, according to this Restoring Internet Freedom Order, um, internet access is not a telecommunication service anymore. It is for federal law an information service. And this is kind of a theological argument um, in, inside federal law, but it has, it had uh, immediate effects on the FCC order. Um, the order purported to preempt the states from regulating internet access. Uh, one of the grounds was that the FCC announced that the federal government had a quote, preemptive policy of non-regulation. And uh, it also preempted states taxing in internet access for universal service. On appeal, um, the DC circuit um, 
issued a very strong reversal of part of the FCC's decision and basically said, okay, if it's not going to be a telecommunications service, then it, where, where do you get the authority to preempt anything? If it's not a telecommunications service, most of your chapter in the federal statute doesn't apply. And um, it, the court struck down the FCC's preemption of state regulation. But um, I think the FCC still retains substantial discretion in the area of universal service. I hope that's not too confusing. Um, so here, I'm gonna go into the revenue options now. I don't know if you wanna pause or should I just keep going and try to finish? Um, I think we're, we're, I'm in the process of writing a note asking if our next witnesses can come 15 minutes later. So I think we'll go through and then okay, I'll, I'll we'll try take to keep, questions at the end. I'll try to keep moving. Okay, so I have five uh, revenue enhancing options. Assuming that you decide that you want to provide some new funding for AMOs at some point in the future, uh, the, I present these five options. One would be uh, a new 1% charge on cable revenues. And this would be to align Vermont with the 6% total charge that's used in California and other places. Um, it would slightly increase the burden on the cable companies, which are now paying about 5.6% roughly um, to the AMOs already. Um, it would change um, the handling of the money rather than the money going direct from cable company to AMO, it would go through the state treasury and it would have to be appropriated. And the AMOs would have to use the money for capital expenditures. Um, the, net, the net increase on burden on the ca cable companies would be about 0 0.4 million um, up from there at about 8.6. Uh, advantages are that similar to charges in other states, um, the disadvantage is it's not competitively neutral it increases the burden on the cable companies, which already have sole responsibility for funding the AMOs. Um, and it involves the state treasury in a new kind of transaction with very little marginal effect. Second option is a streaming video charge. This would be a charge on um, services like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime. It'd be paid to the general fund and appropriated AMOs you could also make it apply to satellite services, which would otherwise uh, perhaps escape the charge. Um, the Vermont sales and use tax, I understand, already covers this. And this may solve a lot of administrative problems and scope issues. Um, there was a decision of the US Supreme Court in a couple of years ago in a so-called Mayfair versus South Dakota or the other way around, um, which expanded the ability of the states to um, charge to require out-of-state retailers to collect and submit sales taxes, it changed the so-called um, nexus requirement, which in, in prior years had been a substantial barrier to collecting sales taxes from out-of-state sellers. Um, this kind of charge has been upheld at least once against a Commerce Clause challenge, and um, other states are considering this. There's a bill in Massachusetts that's being promoted by the AMO industry here. Um, it, it, I think it could improve the alignment between the Vermont residents who benefit from PEG service in the modern age, especially through internet streaming with those who pay for that service. Rather than just requiring cable customers to pay for AMOs, it would, would spread the burden a little more evenly. The disadvantage would be, of course, the cost of administering a new tax. Uh, third option is to raise the VUSF rate. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the VUSF is a program that was enacted during the era of telephone communications. And, um, but I, as I look at it now, I'm not sure that it's that incompatible. Um, the, the VUSF certainly applies to telephone services like E911 to services for the hearing impaired. It also recently has been uh, drafted to support payments for broadband expansion. And so a, a payment uh, expansion further for PEG would not be completely unprecedented. Uh, most of the funding for, from VUSF now goes to the E911 program, but the VUSF isn't raising enough money to match the appropriations and you may have to raise that rate anyway. 
Um, disadvantages is that it's funded by telephone surcharges and it may not be fair to customers to add this, telephone customers to add the additional burden. They're already paying for some broadband costs and now they would have to pay for some uh, peg costs. And um, federal limitations on universal service, which I've discussed, would prevent you from broadening the base of the USF to include internet access payments. Um, you asked me in the step legislation to discuss connection charges and because time is short, I'm just gonna skip quickly through this. Um, the real benefit to connection charges would be if you could define connections to include internet connections and you can't really. So there's some, um, there's some marginal benefit to possibly changing the VUSF from a gross revenue charge to a connection charge. Um, some states, about a half dozen states have done this, uh, but it's outside the scope of my report and I can talk to you later about it if you're, if you're interested in pursuing that. Um, you asked me to look at the telephone personal property tax, um, which provides no revenue currently to PEG programs. Um, the current rate is 2.37% of net book value of a telephone company. Um, this is uh, a, a rather strange tax because net book value once upon a time was a number readily at hand that had been produced for regulatory purposes but it has major defects. It excludes a great deal of investment that is not that is considered non-regulated investment. And it also is subject to a um, uh, high level of depreciation. So it's a, it's the disadvantages as a PEG resource are that it's not competitively neutral because many of the competitors do not pay it. And the revenue is declining as illustrated in this chart, which shows uh, the last 10 years and two years of forecast. And it's almost a straight line decline. So I was unable to pursue this any further because the tax department is bound by confidentiality rules. But my suspicion is that this pattern is a combination of um, the telephone companies that have been paying it are investing more and more in non-regulated assets and their old regulated assets are becoming more and more depreciated. But I can't quantify that for you. Fourth attachment, the fourth option is a new <clears throat> idea. It's a pole attachment charge. And it relies on the fact that <clears throat> Vermont, like a lot of New England, but unlike a lot of the rest of the country, relies heavily on utility poles to transport communication signals. Vermont, as you know, has rocky soils, lots of ledge, and buried cable is, is expensive and infrequent in Vermont. Um, it would include cell companies that you use cables to reach their antennas. So it would be therefore competitively neutral as between the cell companies and the wireline companies. We did a, a survey around the state of how many pole attachments there are on various kinds of highways. I got some GIS help from David Healy, whom you know, and uh, we figured that there's about 440,000 pole attachments for communications, which at a $10 charge would produce about four and a half million dollars a year. Um, the advantages are it's more competitively neutral than charges on cable companies alone or on telephone companies alone. A disadvantage, again, it's a new tax, but perhaps not that bad because the pole attachers already know about how many attachments they have. They pay a, a pole attachment fee to the pole owners. Uh, and to comply with federal law and the 5% limit in Title VI, you probably ought to give um, cable companies a credit for any amount they would pay under this charge. And there's a loose end here of possible federal highway restrictions. Um, I was told when I checked with the transportation agency that any such charge would have to be set aside and used for the purposes of building highways. And um, I inquired a little bit into that and asked for the statutory citation. I read the statute, I read a few cases under it and I did not see how that conclusion was supported by the statute or the cases, but it is a little bit of a mess I'm leaving on your hands. And finally, at the end of the report, I have what I call the multi-part option. In this one, I, I did a lot of different pieces trying to produce a comprehensive proposal that would improve competitive neutrality, hold the, the, um, the general fund harmless and provide a little extra funding for the uh, uh, AMOs. And it had four parts. 
Um, given the time, I think I probably ought to skip them. Uh, several of them are things that I've already talked about individually. Um, one option is one of the pieces is to repeal the personal property tax and re replace it with the uh, new poll attachment tax. And I have a, uh, in the report, I have this table showing all the puts and takes and how the money would move around. And uh, in the recommendations, finally in the report, we recommend that the uh, AMOs continue their efforts to improve efficiencies and seek additional sources of funds. Um, I recommend that you give serious consideration to option number five, which I just skipped through at 100 miles an hour. Uh, it modernizes the, the telecommunications tax structure, it broadens the base in a way that it reflects the increasing use of the internet as a medium for programming, including PEG video. It encourages the AMOs to expand their program benefits to surrounding towns that have broadband but lack cable television service. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Okay. And if you take that down, I can see people. I've got Sandra Bray and our next witness has to leave at 340. So if we want to break, I think I'm going to have to wrap this up. Ms. Dr. Lube, do you have Senator anything? Cummings, my yes. apologies. The next witness leaves, needs to leave at 440. Oh, 440. Sorry, I read that incorrectly. All right, we can do questions. Senator Bray. Yeah, quick question is, uh, are there, I mean, it seems like some of the bit of a mess we're in is because of choices made at the federal level constraining how we can act. Um, is the federal government also involved in looking at the, the same sort of mess that we're looking at and are they proposing, you know, are, is there any relief there like that they're thinking about reorganizing, rethinking how they uh, regulate and it, is there some possible tool that's not yet on the table that we might reasonably expect to get? I, I don't think there's any legislative relief in, in sight. Um, and I don't know about what the FCC might do. I think they might withdraw from the um, renewing internet freedom order if they get a majority of Democrats on the FCC, but how much that would open the way for anything you would wanna do, I, I'm not sure yet. Bob, do you have anything you wanna add? You're, you keep traps, tabs on the FCC more than I do. Yeah, the, the FCC, um has re reserved for itself um, regulatory authority over broadband, which includes being able to use it as a source of revenue. Um, the states, there, there's been an ongoing discussion between state commissioners and federal commissioners about how to change uh, the support of the various universal service programs. And one of those recommendations would allow states to um, put a, a connection charge on uh, internet access. But to date, um, that has been in the background and um, no one can predict whether or not the FCC will, will go in that direction. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Senator Pearson. Did you say we were already applying the sales tax to Netflix and streaming services? Yes, that is my understanding. So you offered that as a solution, but of course that we'd have to make up that, that revenue to the ad fund. Well, I, what I suggested would be an additional charge above the sales tax. So the sales tax revenue is all dedicated, as you know, to the education fund. And so I just sort of kept that all at arm's length. Um, there would have to be a new charge, an additional charge. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So, Dr. Loop, we've you have you got additional testimony? No, I do not. Okay, Lauren Glenn. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lauren Glenn Davidian. I'm the executive director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy in Burlington. And I also represent Vermont Access Network, which is 25 community media centers that provide 
public educational and government access services in Vermont. So thank you so much. We really deeply appreciate the legislative support to have um, this economist look and telecommunication legal look at the question of the future of PEG funding. So we're very excited that this work has been done. And I think on the surface, this um, appears as a very dense and uh, a very dense document, but actually I think it um, boils down to some key concepts that I just wanted to raise with you and then um, just make a couple of comments about next steps and process questions that I have. Um, so I sent a little picture um, in advance. I think Faith may have shared it with you, um, but it was meant to kind of give your eyes a rest and also summarize, I think, the key concepts here in the great work that's been done by Peter's team. Um, I think that this study, even though it originally took up the question of alternatives to the cable franchise fee for PEG access, because of the convergence of the industry and because of the economic model um, in which siloed uh, phone, cable, internet, regulatory units are actually now competing with each other and all in the same business and they're no longer siloed. So our regulation overall needs to be modernized in the telecommunications realm. <clears throat> and so even though this question was about peg funding and cable franchise fees, it inevitably turned over the rock of modernizing the telecommunications regulation framework in the state. And it's based on this core concept that we have public rights of way that we give permission to commercial industry, commercial companies to operate. And in exchange, um, they make a public benefit contribution. The only problem is, is that there isn't a public benefit contribution in the internet, the internet space, regulatory space. And as Peter has outlined, and investigate it, the state's hands are largely tied, but not completely tied. And I think that's what's really important in this study is that it sheds light on where the state's authority is to create a more modern telecommunications tax and regulation system for the state. So um, one of the key concepts here, and I'm just gonna pull out some of the higher level things that Peter didn't really have time to go into, but one of the core concepts is to create a public benefit fund. Um, and it's, he calls it the telecommunications public benefit fund. And that would include um, revenue sources that would help provide public benefits for the use of the communications network, including not only PEG, but also E911. Because in fact, the state, as Peter outlines, the state does have authority to assess a kind of broadband fee for the purposes of funding E911 service. So this is, I think, an important. I think it feeds into the conversations the state's having about the public safety and how to fund E911 because it faces the same decline in landline revenue that PEG faces on the cable side. So at some point you may want um, Berkshire to go in a little bit more detail into the state's authority to do that. I think that's really important. And then um, what this study goes on to outline is these multiple um, areas of authority that the state has to uh, assess an excise tax, which is the example that um, is raised on a cable, uh, an excise fee on cable bills for PEG capital funding. Um, so that's one idea. I think it, that's an idea that has to look, be looked at more closely because I'm not sure it actually solves anything because cable revenue is declining. So if we put an additional excise fee on cable revenue, that's not really an evergreen solution to the, the issue of PEG funding. But as Peter says in his report, it would generate more funds than the current arrangement does. So there are pros and cons on all of these ideas, but I think the, um, the excise tax is an important one. And then this right of way fee. So. Um, Chris, you asked about the streaming tax. You know, there are other states in the country that are looking at a streaming tax as a way to fund PEG. And as Peter points out, there is already a sales tax. So if there was a streaming tax, it would have to be over and above that. Um, 
I'm not sure that the streaming tax actually is, um, maybe this is not the right word, but philosophically uh, the proper foundation for um, a public benefit. And the idea of a poll tax or assessing the public right of way in some way that's within the state authority. So, so poll attachments may be one way to do it. Um, cable miles that run on polls might be another way to do it. That, that's a very straight line between uh, providing public benefits in exchange for commercial use of the public rights of way. And as Peter points out, it, it, it holds to this very key concept that I just want to make sure is right, right in front of you, which is competitive neutrality. So the point here is not to burden the cable operators more or burden any one telecommunications provider any more than they are currently burdened, but to redistribute how the public benefits are funded. And yes, it will actually uh, result in there being additional fees on top of what the many, many the telecommunications providers pay and pass on to their subscribers. But the idea is it would provide, it would apply to all users of the rights of way and go into a public benefit fund. Now, I know that there, and I'll just- Got a question from yep. Senator Bray. Yep, go ahead. Senator Bray. Sure, I just, uh, so I appreciate that you're, you know, uh, aiming for comprehensiveness. It seems like one of the themes of this committee has somehow become whack-a-mole this year. Um, so if another technology is going to do an end run on what we're currently talking about, I mean, it's making me think about where are we with satellites? Because that's another public right of way, the airwaves. And have, are we casting in that broadly enough yet to make sure that there's not another emerging technology that undermines the revenue streams we're talking about now um, and leaves us having this conversation seven years from now, not that, I mean, seven, buying seven years is good, but can we, do we, how do we do satellites? And is there a way to make sure we don't have another problem coming that we're not quite looking at yet? I think that you raise a good point because we're looking for, um, in order, in the, in the process of modernizing telecommunications regulation, you want something that's actually modern and has some legs in the future which is not to say that it won't need to be modernized again, right? Because technology will change. But there's two points. One is contained in the study, which is even the wireless technologies require fiber to get to the distribution points, right? So it, it, to the extent that internet may be provided through wireless means, there will still be a heavy reliance on the wired network to make that happen. So. I think that that bodes well for this model, this emerging model, which does need more discussion. And satellites are in yet another silo, right? They're in a, in a regulatory silo under broadcasting, separate from cable, separate from phone, separate from the internet titles. And um, if you recall, I mean, Peter has recommended that perhaps satellite be included in that streaming model but if you recall, the last time the state wanted to put a tax on satellite, there was a huge outcry. Um, I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. Gee, I, I think we've, we've been to that rodeo more than once. Well, yeah, I'm just I'm, thinking Starlink is now coming out, right? So everyone's starting to hear about Starlink. And, right. Uh, that's another end around. So. The state doesn't have authority over satellite. The FCC is straight line authority over satellite. And so there is, there's no interstate interstate debate there on the satellite side. And um, I bring that up not to discourage us from doing something that might be novel and different, but to understand, as you very well know, there are many parties um, that are going to be reading this study and have a vested interest in this kind of higher level set of recommendations. And I, what I'm interested in is um, talking with you about the process for bringing these ideas to the public and to the, you know, the, the vested interests in the telecommunications industry. So perhaps we can come up with an agreement about what public benefits look like in this era, given what the state's authority is. And I think um, I would just say in conclusion that this 
basket of public benefits because I, I really think that's a key idea here for us to think about um, is a subset of all these other things that you're looking at, whether it's Senator Brock's revival of VTA or if it's the department's you know, broadband fund. I mean, there's this sort of idea of bringing telecommunications resources, you know, resources in the state to fund our infrastructure and capacity. I mean, this is, this is great, right? And, and a lot of it is on your table. And, and I think what's important about this study is it underscores that in that conversation, the public benefits need to be protected and thought about and reorganized within the state's authority to reflect the contemporary age that we are in. I'm watching the time, so I'm gonna try and wrap this up shortly. We are obviously not gonna find the solution this afternoon. Um, there's a lot of moving parts here and um, they all fit together if we're gonna solve this puzzle. And this connects to several other things we're looking at. Senator Pearson. Just quickly, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Lauren Glenn, knowing you, I'm gonna guess that you're connected to your counterparts around the country. And I hope we can come up with some solutions here in Vermont, but are you all working on Congress? I mean, they, they have put so many barriers in our way around just the logic of the approach here uh, that any solution the state comes up with is really gonna be cobbled together, whereas the feds could succinctly solve this problem in a very significant way. So is there any effort that you're aware of or part of in Congress uh, or in front of the FCC to, to fix this? One of the, um, there's sort of the big, the big strategy and the little strategy. So one of the biggest threats that Peter pointed out is this FCC 621 order where essentially they have um, enabled the cable operators to say, you know, those p public educational government access channels, we're gonna put a free market value of $100,000 on those and we're gonna charge you for that, right? So we're gonna reduce your PEG franchise fee by the cost of whatever we decide. We, not whatever, but within the realms of the FCC. So we're trying to fight that so that that doesn't happen. And, um, and we hope with the new FCC, with a democratic majority, that they may withdraw their, um, they may change their position on that, right? So that's one thing that we in the access community are working actively at on. And then um, most recently we are, are, are starting to think about higher level broadband access legislation, but it's a really heavy lift. You know, Chris, I've been working on reforming the telecommunications policy since I wrote the book on it um, almost 20 years ago. So it, it is not likely it's very difficult to get Congress to move in this direction and that the forces of capital are so incredibly strong that there is just a very big push against expanding social benefits, public benefits. So we are working on it. Um, Maine has legislation that, that's a kind of streaming legislation, streaming tax. Um, Massachusetts has one along those lines and New York may be looking at that soon. But again, I'm not 100% convinced on the streaming option. I don't think we should foreclose it, but I think that the right of way model is one we want to look seriously at. Okay. We have got some testimony coming in about right of ways later in the week. Uh, committee, I'm looking for one final question. If not, we're going to take a break. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, Senator Bray. Not a question, Short. it's a thank you. You're into to, cutting your break now. Uh, it's not a question, it's a thank you to Mr. Vidian for giving us uh, eye candy informal infographics. You know, like we've had, we've had a lot of stuff. <laughs> so it's great to have a change of pace. Thanks for sending your artwork along. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you Peter Madam. and Dr. Lube and Lauren Glenn.